Romans chapter 8. You want to read that? <clears throat> Those who are dominated by the sinful nature of their flesh set their mind on sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Can you open up your Bibles real quick? I don't have this in here, but as you were talking, it just came to my mind. Open up to Genesis. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift. The best portions of the firstborn lamb of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's gift, Abel, as his gift and his gift, but he did not accept Cain's and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. He looks dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be, be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the fields, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? How does that relate to what we're reading in Galatians, what we just read in Romans and Galatians? You know, what and caused him to be bitter? He was rejected. He felt rejected. He wasn't accepted. His gift wasn't accepted. He felt lesser than his brother. What made that happen? What made them, what was the reason he was not accepted? Because his gift wasn't as good as his brother's gift. He didn't put as much work into it or meaning into it as his brother did. What were the gifts? Um, the, the lamb. And that was that was Abel's, right? Mm -hmm. was, the, was the lamb. Vegetables. And Cain's was crops. Mm -hmm. Look at what it says. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift. The best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. The problem didn't start with the offering. Where did the problem start? Which, where does that start? When you make a decision in his heart, which is what? What is that based on the... Uh, Cain. So the Bible says that Cain brought some of the stuff from the ground, the crops, right? It doesn't say it was the, first of all, the offerings that he should have brought was not fruit. It should have been a blood offering. When it says that he brought the fat, listen to what Abel, listen to what it says. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs. He already butchered that thing. He already cut it up, diced it up, took the, the heart out, the lungs out, the kidneys out, and he brought the best portions of that cut up sacrifice to offer to God. They would be a burnt, af a burnt sacrifice. But this dude came with some apples and oranges and some watermelon, some corn, whatever he brought. And God's like, wait. I mean, clearly, he didn't, he, his, so his heart was. And you can tell by the way when God corrected him how he answered God. Where's your brother? I don't know. Am I is my brother's keeper? He had an issue with God from get-go. And he's like, I'm not going to give God no firstborn of mine, nothing. But I'm going to go and meet with him. You know how many people come to church with a bad attitude? I don't want nothing from God, but I'm going to go because it makes my mother happy. It makes my wife happy. When I was backslidden and I would get home at five in the morning drunk and Carlo would be like, I said, you said we're going to go to church. And I'd be like, sit at church, stinking like all kind of stuff and just sitting there sleeping. 
And Carla's just sitting there looking at me. I was going not for God. I want nothing to do with God. I was going because she wanted me to go. You think that any of those songs I was singing, clapping, was an offering to God? You think that was acceptable? You think God was like, you know something, son, I'm just glad you're here. We say that. That's the gospel that America preaches. We're just glad you're here. And God is like, I'm not accepting their offering. And that's the problem. That we people are preaching some weird stuff that make people feel comfortable in their sin. And the Bible says that God didn't, not only did he reject the offering, he rejected him. He didn't just look at the offering and say, this is why people say God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Where's that in the Bible? You know what the Bible says? That God hates the wicked and destroys them. But we just want love, love, and everything's love. And what we do is we end up doing a disservice to people who need Jesus or people who are in the church and just not really living right. And we just make people feel comfortable. And God is not, not only is God rejecting their offering when their their money offerings and their worship, and God's like, man, that's just like a it's like a, a putrid smell of rotting carcass coming to mind. When you sing, man, you got such lust in your heart. This people worshiping and they're looking at the woman over there that, that's not their wife and they're looking. That's, and, but they're singing with all that lust in their heart. Man, I can't wait to get home and those, those patriots better win today. But oh, thank you, God. You, man, those patriots. They're not focused on God. They're focused. They're, the Bible says that these people worship me with their lips. But what? Their hearts are far from, their hearts are far from me. Do you think, do we think that God is, 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 is he, that he's, guys, listen, Cain literally thought he could just show up. Here I am, God. Here you go. And God was supposed to be all excited and, well, you're here. And that's what he did think. And when he saw that God looked at his brother with favor and acceptance, he got mad. What about me? I'm here. You know, the prodigal son story, the prodigal son, that's actually, there was two sons in that story. There was the youngest son who was a knucklehead. Then there was the oldest son who, when the youngest son came back and said, oh, my brother, you're home. I love you. I miss you. I'm glad you're okay. You think he said that? He said, this evil son of yours who went out and did all of this, I never left you. I've been here since day one. I've been faithful. You never did this for me. Bitterness. Bitterness in his, and yeah, and the father was happy. He said, hey, listen, my son was dead, but now he's alive. Like, I thought he was gone, but he's here now. I didn't lose him. I'm happy. Why? You should be celebrating. Why are you bitter? That's the same thing as Cain and Abel. Just because he never left the father's house, that don't mean that he was a Christian, so to speak. You know what I mean? He still had stuff in his heart. But look what he says. Why are you so angry, the Lord the Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? Will you be accepted? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse, listen, if you refuse to do, not that you can't do what's right, not that you're unable to do what is right like Calvinists preach. He says, no, if you refuse to do what is right. In other words, you have the capacity to do right, but you're refusing. What part of the human, of the three parts, does the refusing to do what is right? The soul. Why? What part of the soul? The will. That it's God who gives us both the will and the ability to do what pleases Him. All we got to do is not do what He did. Refuse. Look what He says. Then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door and it is eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be what? It's master. Now go back to, now go back here to Romans. Those who are what? Dominated. So overtaken, being those who are mastered by their sin. See, Cain was mastered. By his sinful, he was dominated by his sinful nature. He had a bad attitude. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about his brother. He didn't. He just cared about himself. This is what we call narcissism. This dude only cared about himself. 
He was dominated by his sinful nature. And God said, hey, listen, if you don't get that thing under control, man, it's crouching right outside the door. In other words, whenever you turn around to do something, it's going to get you. And what does he do? He plans the murder of his brother. It wasn't just they were out in a, a moment of heated debate and and he got, you know, it was not a manslaughter kind of moment where he had this uncontrollable angle in the moment because his brother did something to him in that moment. He just lashed out and hurt him. No, he said, hey, bro. He said, hey, bro, let's go out in the field. And he, the King James Version says he rose up against him. In other words, he just came out of nowhere. His brother was, and he just hit him, blow, and just crushed him. He planned the murder of his brother, and God warned him, hey, man, if you don't get that under control, it's going to destroy you. And it did. God cursed him and said, get out. Get out of my presence. Go. The, 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 talk about cutoffs. And remember he was saying about sometimes we can be cut off and sometimes we can cut other. God cut him. God said, go. You're going to wander out there. and I'll put a mark on you so nobody kills you. But you, do, you no longer have access to me. Isn't that crazy? Separated, guys. This, this is serious stuff. See, this is what the church doesn't teach people, and this is why I backslid. I, wasn't, I didn't really have an understanding of all this, so I took my relationship with God for granted, and I let an offense twice. Twice I let people offend me, and that offense made me angry at God. And so I turned my back on God and I went back to the, as a, what was the proverb say? As a, as a, as a dog, as a dog returns to its vomit, so does the fool to his folly. And let me tell you, there were a lot of vomiting nights when I was getting drunk. Back to my stupidity. Why? Because I was mad at God. God didn't make those people hurt me, but I was blaming him. Sin, like Cain, sin was at the door waiting for me, and boy, did it find me. But thank God for grace, huh? But look, those who are dominated by their sinful nature, what do they do? They set their mind. What, is, what do you think that means? They set their minds on sinful things. They're determined. Cain was determined to kill his brother because he was offended that God accepted him and looked favorably on him and accepted him and didn't accept him. So he was mad at God as if it was God's fault. No, it was his fault because he was dominated by sinful nature and his own desires. So his mind was set on murder. And he did it. You know, the book of James says that sin starts as a thought. And if we don't get rid of that thought, it'll become a desire. And if we don't kill it as a desire, it will become actions. And when that action gives is full-blown, it will produce death, separation from God. This mind, if it, it, it wants to dominate, it, you know, it wants the flesh wants to bring our minds to those places. And, and man, it, it, works all, it works in overtime, the flesh. Memories from the past, bitterness, anger, lust, greed, frustration, depression, all of those things. I, you, you, I mean, if you don't get, the Bible says about what? About taking captive th thoughts captive. What does it say? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Romans 1, 21 and 22. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. So they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. See, I'm going to stop right there. This is what's happening in the church today. People are creating foolish ideas of what God is really like. And it can go any way, right? You got these super... Uh, liberals, I don't mean liberal, meaning 
politically liberal or left. I mean, politi- I mean spiritually liberal. We can do whatever we want because we're in Christ, so God forgives everything. Everything is grace and love, and don't matter if I can keep sinning. God just, he just liberally gives all the grace and love, and I can do whatever I want. When the Bible clearly says, don't use your freedom in Christ to be sinful, right? But they forget about those scriptures. It's no, God loves. I gave, I put my trust in Christ, and therefore, I'm good, right? I can do whatever I want. That's that's a foolish idea of what God is like. And then you got Calvinists who are, oh, God sends people. He creates some people to send them to hell because he just, we don't know why, but he just decides to do that. And there's an elect group that we don't know why, but those are his favorites. And those are the ones that he sets aside for himself and put all his favor on them. It's like people come up with these weird, extreme things. It's not. They're misinterpreting scriptures. They're taking scriptures. For instance, they'll say, yeah, because they'll say that people are, that when you're in Ephesians, it says that we are dead in our trespasses. So that they take that word dead and they say, okay, so dead means, dead means you can't respond to God's grace. That God has, you know, given you grace. And uh, you can't receive it because you were dead. So first God has to make you alive. Didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me? So if if life is in Jesus, what life can God give you before? How does he give you life so that then you can accept Jesus to get eternal life? What life is he giving you? There's nowhere in the Bible that says that, right? They, They invent these things. But look at what he says. Look what the Bible says. It says, um, Vadi Bachman. Vadi Bachman is a, a, a Calvinist preacher. He says uh, in a sermon, he says, um, he critiqued the illustration made by some Christians of Jesus throwing a life preserver to a drowning sinner, but the sinner must reach out and grab it. His premise is that only by God's grace are we saved and not of ourselves, which is true. But he says, he believes in what's called total depravity, which is part of a teaching. It's, to me, it's a heresy. It's, a, it's demonic. It's called tulip. And he says, being the state of a person is so dead that an individual is incapable of responding to God's grace in any way. That's called eisegesis. That's taking what you think it says and you put it into the Bible verse and you say, oh, this is what it means. No, that's what you mean it means. That's not what God is saying. So they say, okay, so if a person is dead, Because the whole word is dead, that they're dead in sins. So before we came to Christ, we were dead. That's true. But the word dead does not... See, a lot of people in today, and and I know John Calvin lived 400 years ago, whatever it was, but this has been going on forever, where people will take a word and they'll take the meaning of the word and they'll change it. So that when you say something, when we're having a conversation and I I come into agreement with you about a word, I'm, I'm deceiving you because I changed the meaning of what I mean about that word. So you mean something else. So when I say, hey, we were dead in our trespasses, right? We were, we were dead in our sins. And you say, of course, yeah, we were dead in our sins. You mean dead, meaning you were not responding to God. What I mean by dead is that you were incapable of responding to God. That's two different things. If a person is not responding, that does not equate to inability. It just simply means you're not doing it. God told Cain, you refuse to do what what is right. If you refuse to do what is right, well, how can you refuse if you didn't have the option to choose? Clearly you do, right? So this this is my rebuttal to that is in Ephesians chapter 2. This is the scripture. This is the verse. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. What's the problem with that? Well, remember, Body Bachman says a dead man cannot grab the life preserver that Jesus throws him because he's dead. And his whole, the whole gotcha moment that he, that went viral on TikTok, YouTube, was him saying dead men or dead people don't grab their dead. 
In other words, if you're dead, you're, you're not able because you're dead. So you can't reach for salvation if you're dead. Do you see that? So, again, the word conflating, putting together two things that don't mean the same, but you give one definition to make them mean the same. You link them together by the word dead. Dead does, in a spiritual sense, does not mean incapable. It simply means unwilling. So, if he's, if, and they're using Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. So, if, it's, if Paul says to the Ephesians, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Do you see any dead people walking? Do you see zombies out here? So if somebody's dead and they can't reach or they can't grab a life preserver, how are they walking? According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Wait. Dead people don't disobey because they're dead. How can dead people, if they can't grab, how can they choose to disobey? Among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind. Wait, how can a dead person conduct themselves in any way that fulfills lusts and passions? They're dead. So they're making a choice to live in the lustful passions of their mind and their, and their sinful nature. That's a decision. But dead people don't decide, according to Calvinists. Um, and then he says, and we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and through 7. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. Wait, I thought we were dead. How were we walking and living if we were dead? Does it make any sense? No, it doesn't make sense. But yet, this type of foolishness gets taught for the last 400 years, and people just accept it. Because they're, they're, they have left the word of God and began to follow a man. It's the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism. They all started with the Bible and then some guy wrote a book to add to the Bible and people just went with it and they said, oh, we don't need the Bible, we got the book of John Smith. Right? Oh, we got the other one, uh, the Watchman, or the Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower. We, no, you need this book. This book helps you understand the Bible. Then once you, it's a cult. And then once you come in, you, you figure out they don't even use the Bible in this place. They're only using this one book. It's no longer about the Bible. And that's what people did with John Calvin and, and Martin Luther. That's where they got Calvinism. And then, and then they do this crazy switcheroo where then they call it Reformed Theology, which sounds so beautiful. Because I believe in Reformed theology. Theology is the study of God. Reformed means you've been transformed, you've been changed. So the study of God changing people, Reformed theology. Beautiful. Yeah, we all agree on that. But again, they take, that, they take those words and they change the meaning. Another one, they call it the doctrines of grace. This is all part of Calvinism. The doctrines of grace. Well, I believe in the doctrines of grace, but not their way. Their doctrine of grace is that the grace that God gives a person to be saved is irresistible grace. Meaning that you were just minding your own business. You weren't thinking about God. You wanted nothing to do with God. You were just living your life. And then all of a sudden, God's grace came and just kidnapped you, tied you up, put you in the trunk, drove you off to paradise and said, now you're saved. You had nothing to do with it. You didn't believe. You didn't have faith. You didn't choose Christ. You just were snatched off your feet and you were brought into his kingdom because he, he irresistibly chose you. That's what they mean by grace. Yeah, everybody was like this. Whoa, whoa, that sounds weird. Yeah, but people teach this and believe There's churches right here around here that teach this stuff. And nobody questions it. They're like, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, yeah, because salvation, it's, it's, not, it's not by works, it's by grace. God gave it to us. Yeah, but God also says that you had to what? But even before that, you had to do what? What? Repent. What? believe faith comes by what 
hearing. Not by predestination, not by election, by God's mysterious whatever. No, it came by faith, by believing that you heard. I, I witnessed to you at work. I told you what, however many years ago, hey, you should come to church. And, and I tried to live my life. And you were like, I'm going to go visit that church. Then you heard the gospel. And you decided, I believe this. You decided that. God didn't decide for you. You decided. God offered a, 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 his grace. Hey, I love you. And I have a purpose and a plan for your life. Do you want to know what it is? Yeah, I do. All right, follow me. Okay, I'll follow. You decided that. I decided that. We all decided that. It didn't just happen against our will. The, and this is the real problem because when you go deeper into this, you said the word repent. Repentance, when they, <clears throat> uh, Sunday, when, we were, when I was preaching from Galatians, and I went to the book of Acts in chapter 2, and Peter was preaching after the day of Pentecost. And I put it in big, bold letters on purpose. <clears throat> when they said, oh, what do we need to do? And he said, repent and be baptized. And then the gift of the Holy Spirit will come to you. So that's the thing. They, they think up foolish ideas that don't match the Bible. And they create a whole movement, a whole religion. Based on what a man says, the Bible says or means, you know? So, um, so letting your sinful nature control your mind. So what does that mean? What is the sinful nature? The what? The flesh. The, the flesh. The body. The desires of the body. You know, is sex, did God create sex? Yeah. Yes. But did he uh, did he create it for it to be unfettered sexual relations with just anybody like like a wild animal, or did he put boundaries on it? He put boundaries on it. Even drinking, a lot of people don't believe this and and agree, and that's fine. But drinking, the Bible never says drinking is bad. What is bad? Drunkenness. Drunkenness is bad. But people can't handle you go because why? Because they're they're being they're being dominated by their sinful nature. But you have a glass of wine with your meal, that's not sin. You get a whole bottle, two bottles of wine and a couple shots. Now, now you're no longer enjoying grapes of the vine. Now you're feeding something else. So there's things that God created that he put boundaries on. I'm allowing you to do this, but don't go outside those boundaries. This is what happened in the garden. He said, I'm creating all these trees that are good for food and pleasing to the eye, but don't touch that one. A boundary and they violated the boundary they wanted what god said don't have so god creates these things and he says you can have these but then people they let the sinful nature go beyond the boundaries spirituality did god make us spiritual yes but within boundaries what are the boundaries him don't go outside of spirituality that's connected to him but then we start going into witchcraft. We start going into meditation and Hinduism and yoga and whatever. And God says, you know, I know your spirit, wants, but you're listening to the flesh that feels good. But letting the spirit control your mind, where's, what, what part of us is the mind in? What part of it? The soul. So he says, letting the spirit control your mind. The mind is the soul. So what is he saying when he says letting the spirit control your soul, your, your mind? Letting your soul be mastered or guided or led by the Holy Spirit, right? Remember I was saying, showing you guys before on this diagram where relates to God, communion with God. God consciousness, we're, we're, we're aware that there's a God. So the Holy Spirit is, is connecting with our spirit. In, in the book of Acts, Stephen gets martyred. He gets, he's the very first Christian to die for his faith in the Bible, right? And he's, he's arguing with the religious Jewish Pharisees, and he says, yeah, and he says, you stiff-necked and stubborn people, you're just like your forefathers. Which one of the prophets 
did they not kill? And then he says, will you always resist the Holy Spirit? Wait, will you always resist the Holy Spirit? And he's going back generations. He's not just talking about them. So there are people who the Holy Spirit was trying to reach them, and they were doing what? Resisting, which means what? You what? You have a choice. You're rebelling. What'd you say? You're being led away from God or towards God. But it's up to the person, the individual, to respond. So the Holy Spirit is is using the consciousness that God Himself put in every single human being. Let's not forget. This is what's crazy when people just they they just nonsense. The Bible says that God made every human being what in His image. So inside of every human being, there is a purpose that each one of us has to reign and rule and dominate creation for God. We all are his representatives here on earth. But not everybody is aware of that or being led into that or following that. Why? Because as Stephen said, they're resisting what the Spirit is calling them to do, which is what? Submit themselves to God and allow God to lead them to do what is right. Who are you? This is the question. Who are you? Remember we we did that with the added with the thing. Oh, I'm no no not what you do. Who are you? This is the question for all of us. Who are we? And based on if we're connecting with God, we're going to know that we're children of God. But if this is if we're rebelling and resisting the Holy Spirit, this is not even working. This is all that's working. And what tends to happen is people become highly emotional and erratic. People become very intellectual. I'm going to go to study and get. I'm going to study and get ten PhDs, and I'm going to be this math wizard, and I'm going to be an astronaut, and I'm going to I'm going to be a doctor, or I'm going to do business. And they become so so intellectually haughty. They feel that, and that becomes their god. They become so emotional that they can't even hear God. And so what happens? Their will is to submit and be dominated by pleasure. So when you see somebody who's in bondage to or addictions, this part is not functioning. It's only the mind and or the emotions and the will of the person is to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do you see that? If this part is not working, if we're resisting the Holy Spirit when He's convicting us, when people are given, you know, people out there who are refu- they're not saved, and we're giving them the gospel, hey man, Jesus loves you, bro. He died on a cross for you. He has a purpose for your life. I don't want to hear none. We were we were doing the uh, we were at Stop and Shop. Him and I were at Stop and Shop last week, giving out invitations and flyers and things over here, right over here. And this lady walked in with a carriage and I said, hey, you look like you're in a rush. And she stops and looks at me, and I'm like, uh, can I give you one of these? And she looks at it, she goes, what is that? I said, I didn't even have the words all the way out of my mouth. I said, an invitation chair. I don't want that. And kept going. What was she doing? Resisting the Holy Spirit. I invited her. She didn't want to hear the good. She didn't even let me give her the good news. She was, pew. Do you know that the Bible says that there are people, their conscience towards God is seared with a hot iron? There, why do you think there are people who become mass, mass murderers? pedophiles, corrupt politicians that can be, they're so sleazy, they can be bought with anything because they have refused and resisted the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's a time when they will, they will acknowledge, this will be turned on and they will acknowledge God and then they will begin the journey. And for some people, the journey takes a while, but for some it's right away. And they'll begin to grow, and they'll begin to, to grow in knowledge of God. Their mind and their emotions will be, will be healed, and their will will be do, to do the will of God. And their body will, will, will respond in a way where they're, they're, how they relate to people around them and their relationships are all well and good. You know, it takes time. But this is why the Bible talks about the process called what? Sanctification. In other words, we come as we are, a hot mess. Nothing to offer him except a disgusting resume of filth that we've been through. That's it. And we just say, God, I just trust you. I I can't do this anymore. And we give him everything that we are, everything that we're not, everything we hope to be. We just, we come and we just, God, I just need you. 
I trust you. It becomes so cliche. It becomes so traditional where I don't think people really understand. Jesus said, count the cost, right? Because who starts building a, who starts a building project and without first having the budget, lest they start the project and then halfway through realize they didn't have enough and they built, and everybody's going to say, ah, look, they started and couldn't finish, right? And he was referring to the decision to follow him. So sometimes we tell people, hey, just pray this prayer. Jesus, I, I receive you into my heart. Do you know, where is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? Where does it come from, bro? Like, it's just, bro, hundreds of years. Somebody came up with this idea. Just receive Jesus into your heart. Bro, that's not in the Bible. Yeah, that's not in the Bible. I'm not saying if you pray that, because I prayed that prayer. That doesn't mean you're not saved. But that does. But what happens is you grow and mature, and you realize, like, okay, that that I need more than just receiving Him in my heart. Like, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. The Bible tells us to repent, repent, rethink where you're going, and choose you this day, as Joshua said, whom you will serve. And so then you make a decision and say, you know what, I need that. But it has to be, you know, the Bible talks about two different sorrows. What are they? What is, what is godly sorrow? What does that lead to? Godly, the Bible says godly sorrow leads to repentance. But what about worldly sorrow? Why? You have regret. And that regret is not enough to bring us to salvation. Godly sorrow, when the Holy Spirit shows us the depth of what we did that was wrong, and our spirit, now this is where you, me, nobody, nobody can understand this because we're not God. But when a person truly, and I use that word truly kind of in a mysterious way, because I don't know your heart, you do. And you know what? Sometimes you don't. Because the Bible says sometimes the heart is desperately wicked. Who can trust it? Who can? So if a person truly gives their life to God, then there will be change. Again, sanctification, the process. Now, it wasn't until almost four years ago when even though I, I came back to the Lord and everything, but it wasn't until four years ago where God took me to the next step in my sanctification, which is the deep root of work, which I'm always talking to you guys about. And this is what I'm... I, this is what I believe God called me to minister about is the deep wounds in people that nobody wants to talk about or deal with, right? People just don't want to confront those past hurts. And so people struggle with their emotions and their mind and they make, man, I want to do good, but I just keep messing up. I keep falling back into addictions. I, I keep, you know, I want to do the right thing, but I, I keep messing up. And, and it's because there's things deep inside that God wants to heal. I'm going to show you this real quick video, guys. And then uh, we're going to end it. Okay, is that all right?